right. Well, it's good to it's good to see you again. Good to see you too. How's your uh, winter wrapping up? How's your spring? Uh, uh, it was just doing doing pretty good. We're getting some uh, getting some sunshine finally, and um, better than your winter. You had plenty of snow. I had a we had a couple weeks of shutdown. Yes. <laughs> we, yeah. I, I remember I remember uh, a delirious video where you were lying in on your bed of pain and you were waving a copy of my book. I don't know if it was helping or hurting you. It was really helping. I still have it right here. Can can we see it? It's yeah. Culture War by uh, Alexander Adams and the subheading, if that's the right word, is Art, Identity, Politics and Cultural in Entryism. And this is one of the kinds of books I, I'm just going to do this now so I don't have to introduce you. All right. Um, well, this is Alexander Adams. He's a uh, you're an art critic and an artist yeah. in the European Union or disunion, <laughs> as the case may be. At, at the moment, at the time of recording, I am. Yes. Yeah. But um, every time I pick this up, I, I start ranting in my head about things that I care about, such as art and politics. Uh, so it's, it's one of those books that... Uh, it starts making my brain go ba 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 ba, and having a bunch of things to say, and I want to go and take a bunch of notes. So, thank you. Well, I, I felt like I had to write it because I was in a position to write it. I had, uh, I had this backlog of essays because it, it comprises of um, a series of essays that I wrote over the last two two and a half years, and I felt, um, you know, I could have just sort of pushed for sort of pure art criticism, you know, just discussing painting or sculpture or something. Uh, and I felt that, well, now I have this platform, I have a bit of a reputation, I've published about 500 articles or something in various journals, and I now have a position to speak uh, through a book to a wider audience. And I felt it was really my duty to try and address some of these things, uh, and so I could bring these essays together and look at the influence of politics, and especially identity politics on art. Yeah, and you come down pretty darn hard against identity politics, and the what I, the feeling that I get from your essays um, in this collection is that it's actually compromising the aesthetic world as well as even the ethical uh, realm of, of liberalism, broadly considered. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but I think because identity politics states that you can't um, you can't look at things in aesthetic terms. And that means that everything is political. There is no way of cutting out the politics. And once you accept that, you simply can't use aesthetic criteria for discussion of this. This is exacerbated by the fact that postmodernism is sort of uh, the anti-aesthetic position in that it states that, you know, you can't discuss aesthetics because aesthetics demands uh, consensus on uh, certain terms on certain parameters, definitions of beauty and truth and what art is and so forth. And if you're um, enmeshed in the uh, postmodernist worldview, then these are simply no longer touchstones for you. Everything is relative. So therefore, aesthetics is essentially null because no one can come to any agreement. And so this gives you, in effect, um, an entry into turning art venues into centers of political dissemination. Mm -hmm. And a very specific political dissemination. Yeah, so this is something that I, I rail against um, in this sort of the statement that we put out last year that it was um, opposed to identity politics. One of the things, one of our points was that um, it's good for there to be um, a, a political diversity. So you end up with a political monoculture because if you if you are an artist, uh, a professor, an arts administrator, a head of a charity or an, or an NGO, the chances are that you've got a particular worldview. And that worldview is sort of left, liberal, progressive, which is fine. Um, and you've all been to university, you all speak the same language, you have the same common reference points. You all, in Britain, read the same newspaper, you vote for the same party. And it's not a question of uh, a conspiracy, a political conspiracy, but it's just of political conformity because you have people working along parallel tracks going for the same goal because they've got, they don't need to communicate, they don't need to conspire because they all have pretty much the same aim in mind. Mm -hmm. um, and this ends up in the programming of the arts. So you have a situation where you don't get art that is uh, in favour of Brexit. 
uh, almost all the artists and arts organizations are anti-Brexit. Uh, you don't have any art that is uh, anti-abortion or anti-migration mm -hmm. or anti-multiculturalism or skeptical about transgender rights or anything like that. Mm -hmm. That simply does, doesn't appear in publicly funded arts galleries. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, that brings up a whole topic about the nature of art and the nature of an art or a piece of art as opposed to an artist being for or against some sort of political action. And I wonder if the uh, if an artist who concentrates on the aesthetic isn't just uh, not being able to plug themselves into this venue because their politics it, not even that their politics doesn't align with the venue, but they themselves aren't playing a political game with their art. So in a way, they're castrating themselves from, no, they're, they're blocking themselves from entry into these venues because they're dealing with things that are on a completely different wavelength. Yeah, so if you're an artist who's essentially concerned with aesthetics or you're, you've got a very sort of private um, art language or a private set of references or you're involved in some sort of abstruse symbolism and so forth, you're not, or, you, or indeed you're an abstract artist, um, that very often you find that you're not producing political work. And I'm not saying that there should be um, a, counter, a counterbalance to the progressive side of um, political art. Yeah. Personally, I feel that art benefits from having no politics at all. So I'm certainly not pushing for a sort of a conservative agenda in the arts. But you're just I'm making the more, point that in and of itself, you can't do anything but this one narrative. Yeah. And also the problem is that if you have, the, if you adopt the progressive mind view, um, that what you're doing is you look at the world in terms of uh, you're either supporting pro, uh, uh, progressivism or you are opposed to it. There is no neutral ground because if you're neutral in, in from the progressive worldview, what you are doing is you are siding for the status quo. You are supporting systems which are essentially inherently oppressive and inherently marginalizing and so forth. So therefore, you are essentially collaborating with the enemy, yeah. and therefore you are the enemy. Yeah. So you en you end up with a situation where you have neutral artists, artists who don't have a strong political view, or their political views don't come into their art at all. You couldn't discern their politics from you know from their still life painting or from their uh, landscape photography. You just can't infer it at all. But um, this is getting mar. This is I'm going to say marginalized. This is getting edged out by more political art. <laughs> well, if we if we consider progressivism and its hold over the cultural milieu and the centers of power in what gets seen and what gets published and what gets widely disseminated. If we see that progressivism as a narrative, then maybe we can map that onto Christianity. And if we look at the history of Christianity, that produced, I mean, I don't want to be ethnocentric or anything, but it produced a wealth of some of the greatest art that we've ever come across, right? So why Absolutely. isn't progressivism as a narrative, as a grand narrative like Christianity, pushing uh, and able to produce grand art in the same vein that, that Catholicism does, did with cathedrals and what adorned the cathedrals? And... Well, but then you could say that, okay, well, Christianity, Christian art was the foundation for most of Western civilization, and I'd go along with that. But you have, um, then you've got to think in terms of uh, the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation and a pluralism of views. I think the problem is that you're getting a homogenization of views. Hmm. Although when progressives talk about diversity, um, you think that they actually mean diversity. They actually mean um, non-majority. So that's why you can have um, diversity in the form of uh, the Black Panther movie, which is essentially a black cast. And this is uh, lauded as being, prog as being uh, diverse. It's not diverse at all. It's, it's, it's essentially mm. black. Well, it's uh, diverse in a is, wider it's, context. It's diverse in a wider context. Yeah. It's, it's anti-majority, anti-majority white. Uh, but then, of course, you could say, well, if you look at the overall population of the entire world, um, black and uh, Asian people outnumber white people. So, you know, but, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the point is that what you're getting is you're getting an international um, perspective on the arts. So it's international, it's liberal, it's progressive, it's, um, uh, it's postmodern. Hmm. And this is actually, in a way, enforcing a conformity uh, upon um, upon the arts 
in a way that um, I'm not sure that Christian art did. I mean, you had the Council of Trent and so forth, and mm -hmm. the Counter Reformation, but um, but when I I, I, I think that there's very difficult to have po isolated pockets of um, difference in the world if you're in an interconnected world and everyone has access to um, the internet, they have uh, access to ideas about art, and then in your local gallery you'll have a Damien Hirst, you'll have a Jeff Koons, you'll have a, you know, a whatever, you'll have a Cindy Sherman photograph or whatever. And this is now becoming spread throughout the world. And I think that this is perhaps a little bit different from the national schools that you see in uh, the Christian art period of the Renaissance. Hmm. Okay. When the... I wonder if you can draw a difference between the goals of, let's just say, medieval Christian art. And by art, I mean the whole cultural product. Um, it seems like the goal behind that was to awe the viewer, to overwhelm the viewer, to lift the viewer up. Um, mm. I wonder if the goal of progressive-ish art is to adduce, is to imprint, is in and itself focused in, in another direction, not, not to stretch you out, but to, to make mm. you agree. Yeah, I think I think uh, in some way, yes, you've got you've got the sense that. Um, well, I mean, Christian art was also didactic in a way that political yes. art is is didactic. So I don't think we should overlook that aspect. But I think that um, yes, I think the the aspect of Christianity was that it was supposed to be uh, individual. I mean, certainly Protestant art, it was to do with individual communion c communion with God, and this that this was a transcendent private experience, mm -hmm. and that there was no uh, correct way. Of having this experience, whereas I think in political terms, um, the art is very much of today is is much more restrictive. So you can't you can't look at any art um, hmm. today and think, oh, the correct um, response to this is that um, uh, you know that racism is good, or that, you know you, 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 there's a very there's a very limited set of responses that you can have to the art of today. Hmm. Um, and I think that it's, um, hmm. I think it's, I think it's designed to shut off options rather than to open up options. And by art, you mean specifically verified art, you know, the blue check mark of the art world, right? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm been since the publication of the book, I've been thinking more widely about what it is when we talk about art and we talk about, um, so, for example, I've been thinking a lot about um, the political scene in America where you have these uh, uber liberals who go to uh, public pro protests and say, no, 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 bo no borders, no walls, uh, no USA at all. And I often think about that in terms of um, postmodernist art, whereas this, this drive for um, multimedia art, multidisciplinary art. And recently, there's, there's been this advert um, promoting in Britain the Serpentine Art Gallery, which is a very sort of postmodern progressive agenda. And they're talking about um, uh, one of the curators says, we want to do away with these barriers between art and the rest of the world. And it's not only dealing with um, the boundaries between painting and sculpture and video and photography and so forth. It's actually abolishing the line between fine art and pop art, between high art and low art. And also between art and everything else, mm -hmm. um, and you wonder, well, you take that too far, and then people are going to wonder, is there art at all? In one of your essays, you actually go into that, and you make several points to the effect that when the gallery, or let's just say the museum, stops uh, focusing on that narrow purview of the curation and, I guess we can say, fine art, or making like this qualitative... Uh, you know, boundary to what it produces, then it becomes unnecessary because everything that's in it can be found much easier everywhere else and doesn't require what the museum offers. Yeah, exactly. You find, well, what's the point of a pop concert in an art gallery? You might as well go to a, a proper pop concert in, a, you know, in a decent sized arena. Yeah. Or you go to a rock concert or, you know, if you want to see a film, why don't you go to an art cinema? rather than, you know, having to go into some sort of gallery which has been sort of badly adapted to show this film. Um, and that these, and the, the, the museums um, are often neglecting things that they do best. 
and they do best in you know presenting presenting works of art works of fine art on the walls to viewers uh, in a sort of carefully curated lighted um, uh, managed environment mm-hmm. and also a curated environment where it's been inten- uh, intelligently laid out so that you can sort of um, follow various connections and it mm-hmm. makes it accessible um, and this is something that you can't find easily elsewhere uh, mm-hmm. unless you're in a particular urban environment where you can find very very major galleries um, commercial galleries and where you can see this sort of art and it seems like there's different ways to talk about why that is the case or why the museums are going in that direction and you mentioned like there's this monoculture uh, of the way that they think about things which disallows them from actually uh, becoming more robust about critiquing their position so their position just uh, just ramps up and just keeps on gaining more and more momentum so it seems like there's a, a loss of faith in the property of the aesthetic that is not just simply physical pleasure or visual pleasure or oral pleasure though it's rooted in pleasure there's it almost seems like there's a transcendence or a or a a reaching towards the the finest uh, aspect of the sense of the aesthetic experience that can only be achieved by true masters of form, somebody who's dedicated their life and sacrificed a lot to achieve that, or I guess imbued with some sort of uh, you know natural inclination to be able to, to find that. Um, and what I see over and over and over again is that the the draw of going postmodern, the draw of going progressive, the draw of going a- in the direction of activism rather than the direction of aesthetics is that it it erases the the fail state of like not achieving true beauty because i'm achieving the correct ends because i'm i'm right and correct i don't have to worry about being ugly anymore Mm. yeah because it it, what it um it allows you to do is to avoid the whole aesthetic thing completely because you're um, because you're operating in a field which is now postmodern, it's sort of post-aesthetic, um, and therefore you can uh, concentrate solely on to do with the idea of, uh, you'll hear buzzwords about challenging, about exploration, about sort of um, confronting certain things, uh, and all of this avoids the, the business of formal analysis, formal aesthetic analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is uh, this seems like a, it's a strategy to avoid um, objective criticism, uh, I mean, Obviously, all criticism is going to be subjective to a degree, but yes. you can certainly talk about, you know, the outstanding um, uh, qualities of certain artists uh, compared to other artists. Um, so once you've got into this business of uh, becoming a political worker, especially um, especially if you're in like a, a, a collective, because there are so many more artist collectives now that go by sort of group names and they have changing rosters of various writers and uh, intellectual theorists and architects and uh, journalists and so forth and they come together in these aesthetic groups uh, these um, co- artistic groups these collectives um, and this is necessarily relates to something else which is the sort of very left-wing socialist uh, aspect of these um, hmm. art projects is that there's a, a great there's scorn towards the idea of a genius. There's scorn towards the idea of the outstanding individual who has um, access to great abilities or great knowledge or insight um, and uh, expresses this through superlative artwork um, because it has this, uh, it has carries this taint of um, the elite, of the, of the great artist, of the great man theory, which is something that the Marxists completely reject. Um, and you see this um, again and again, especially with regard to feminism. I've been reading about feminist art theory, and one of the arguments is that um, essentially it's sort of uh, anti-canonical. Um, there's this great suspicion of not only the established Western canon for fine art, it's the idea of any hierarchies at all. Yeah. So one art theorist says we must um, absolutely avoid falling into the trap of setting up our own parallel uh, canon because then we're going to be falling into the, the fallacy of the, of the great person theory. Um, so this so sort of feminism, postmodernism and progressivism all sort of are all interlinked. 
But the problem with that is that it... I'm not saying whether or not the great man theory <laughs> is true in and of itself, but it, insofar as it drives individuals towards aspiring to the greatest possible limits of their ability, it, it's absolutely, uh, it's very beneficial, let's say. It's, it, it has value in that. Now, the, the pitfall of that is that then you have a bunch of people with egos, but the egos will be smashed upon the rocks of, of their own death and, and history, uh, no matter what. Maybe they'll be insufferable um, to be around, but these groups are just as insufferable as the great man <laughs> or the pretender to the throne would be. Um, so you're not really losing out on that by, but you're not you're not diminishing the ego by taking the great man theory out of, uh, out of circulation. But what you are doing, I think is limiting the ability for that person to rise. Um, or, but yeah. maybe you're just forcing them to go in another direction and to go into a place where there is demand for excellence. And I think that, you know, with video games, with movies, uh, with TV shows, stuff like that. Yeah. But what, what you find is with most artists, they will start their life emulating another artist. Yeah. They'll be a, a, emulating a role model, and then they will surpass them. They yeah. only achieve anything when, once they move out of the orbit of Caravaggio or Leonardo or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That this is this is a necessary you no. Know, it's a necessary human quality to emulate someone you admire, to achieve what they achieve, and then to surpass them to do something original. Um, so I think that you know having these role models or having aspirant figures. Is, I think it's it's a natural human thing that we do. I don't think there's any way of avoiding it. I think we we are sort of we are hardwired as these kind of as the apes that we are to look at uh, community members and to aspire to follow what they have done, which has made them successful, which we think will make us successful. But we are only becoming to become truly successful if we surpass yeah. the person we emulate. Yeah. And have you seen in your research? Um when when these hierarchies are demolished is there any ability to emulate anybody else like what happens with that that stage of development of the artist you're not supposed to well, like focus on one person you're supposed to focus on an idea it becomes like this suffuse abstract thing that you emulate well in in some ways it, it can be and so it, it depends i mean you have something like the mexican uh, prince collective of the 1920s and 30s which is actually quite a positive development that you have uh, people working in this um, uh, studio in uh, Mexico City and they're all broadly socialist and they're all making uh, cheap art uh, that can be sold to the people that can be reproduced in newspapers and so forth and books and sort of the penny print the penny press um, and th this, this is actually a, quite a positive thing where they're sort of setting aside their ego to work in this collaborative a area but then you can also get into the area of um, uh, the idea of uh, socialist realism in the USSR and then starting in sort of 1935, 1936. And that continues through sort of those sort of heroic realism and um, mm. various strains of, of um, socialist realism, which is different from social realism. Um, and this can be quite sort of... Um, um, it, it's it's quite odd because it also involves the academic practice of copying your master at the academy. So although on one hand you're sort of taught that um, we are we are all equals and that, that sort of there there are no great men and no one is distinguished by birth only by um, the effort that they put in and their their the level of their political correctness. Uh, you also have this a parallel thing of the academic tradition, which continues in especially in China where you go and you learn from your master and you emulate him, even though you're in this system which is telling you not to emulate um, mm -hmm. great figures. Mm -hmm. I was thinking uh, there's a lot that you speak about here that maps onto uh, the, theory, mm -hmm. I, the theorizing I've been doing about what happened at the Evergreen State College and broadly and what the Evergreen State College means for this particular activist, far leftist, progressive-ish uh, attitude and ideology uh, anywhere that it goes. This is what eventually happens. And what, what we see happen at Evergreen was that they put more and more emphasis on characteristics rather than character. And when they moved away from core principles such as hard work, such as uh, intelligence and, you know, 
the pursuit of the great, the pursuit of, of achievement, and rather try to share the achievement in an equity, equitable manner so that everybody has achievement. What eventually happened is that great people arose within that. Uh, people with certain characteristics and with very strong character, which turned out to be character that exhibited pretty bad traits, they rose up to power, they took control, and they decimated everybody else, or they forced everybody else to obey them. Um, and it seems like without that filter of quality control, the characters themselves who were strong enough to rise to the top and who had the correct characteristics, they didn't have any sort of capacity to even edit their own behavior or to reckon with how their behavior was good or bad. The quality control was completely t stripped out of that. Um, and it, there's always yeah, a dialogue well, between the aesthetic and the ethic. Oh. Yeah, well, I, I would say that what you're talking about there is essentially a political party. It becomes a political movement. And if the political movement is based on being... Uh, moving leftwards or moving rightwards, it doesn't really matter, um, then uh, the leader always has to be on the extreme. They always have to be leading okay. because uh, what they're doing is they're testing, they're testing right. their boundaries of how much they can do and they're also um, uh, they're, they're proving their loyalty to the cause by going even further. Um, so it's a demonstration of um, commitment. It's also it's a, it's a purity test. You know, do you follow the most extreme member, or are you basically, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are you more leaning towards the status quo? Are you complacent? I do, you know. So essentially, that's a that's a political movement. Yeah, you're you're about. you're either pushing or you're causing drag, or you're slowing everybody else down by being dead weight. Exactly. And so what you said just now about the political party being based on a direction such as progress or such as I guess there might be a right um, a rightish uh, word, I guess, tradition. Like if, if it's not how is it yeah. how is a collective or a political party uh, based? What kind of values um, can cause it to not put to the forefront the most extreme individual? Like are, is that possible? Or does it need to just be locked in contention with another party? Um, I think it's essentially... I don't think the ideas matter that much to the people. I think it's um, it's essentially tribalism. It's, you know, if you've got this mindset of, well, we have to divide the world into us and them, and them might be sort of consist of several different groups, but essentially it's them. Um, so what you've got is you've got some... Uh, you get into the, uh, the, the righteous mind as it were, of, of Jonathan Haidt, where it's, it's a, a lot of it is tribal loyalty. And I, I saw that, um, I saw that especially when I, because I talk in the book about um, Comicsgate, which mm. is um, this sort of uh, manifestation of um, sort of progressivism, left-wing activists entering, which is, what I, which is where the cultural entry, entryism comes from. Uh, it's a manifestation of cultural entryism, where people on the left... Uh, came into the comic book industry, specifically uh, Marvel Comics in the last three years. And what they did was they they radicalized it, they they pushed their own beliefs. It was a game of sort of uh, capture the flag, you know, sort of like, oh, we've got one of our writers doing Captain America, and now Captain America is, is not only a Nazi, he was not only a, um, uh, an agent of uh, the enemy, he was always an agent. So therefore, they've, retro they've retroactively mm -hmm. changed canon that this guy, who you always admired as a good guy, he was, he's not only bad, but he was always bad. Yeah, Tana and Hansi Coates of, wrote that. Exactly. That, uh, well, was yeah, it? He, he, he has, he, he, I think he's writing it now. Um, I think it might have been Nick Spencer who did it originally. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not completely expert on that, but. So you've got this thing of, uh, you can, it's sort of capturing the flag, it's sort of, um, making a point and you can see this in the way that um their their politics is is completely hypocritical it was sort of uh they'll go after their opponents and they'll call them racist and then they discover oh the critic is black or you know they'll call them homophobic and then they'll find out oh that critic the person who's criticizing this was actually um gay or transsexual or whatever and it's like well 
that's tribalism. Yeah. Because if it was ideological, then they would say, oh, actually, we've done something wrong. We were wrong for criticizing you. And by the tenets of our own ideology, oh, huh. we have been acting badly. So therefore, we would like to extend our apologies. And, you know, but this never happens. It's always doubling down. It's always going after the person and saying, oh, well, if you're not a racist, then you must be a sexist or a misogynist or a transphobe or whatever. Okay. And so this, you can find this in Comicscape, which is a manifestation of tribalism. Um, even though it is ostensibly to do with uh, okay. ideological pro progressivism. Yeah, you, you mentioned that you break down in one of your la later essays in the book, you, you break down um, the left, right, and you kind of throw it out the window and you're like, the left, the right, it doesn't matter because a person on the extreme of the left can go extreme libertarian or extreme right it, because it's the extremity extremity of their belief that they're addicted to not necessarily that it's, it's a psychological outlook rather than the ideas the ideas could be right or left that's where you can get a communist becoming a, a fascist or a hardcore libertarian becoming um you know sort of an anarchist or whatever yeah and so what you what you uh, redefine and i've seen this other in other places is that there's liber libertarian and authoritarian. And I think somebody's made like a, like a, you know, a quadrant thing where, yeah. you know, you want more freedom or more authority or more tradition or more pro progress. I can't remember all the different um, aspects of it, but is it ever possible for us to escape our tribalism or is it only possible for us to put our tribalism below a higher value and just like stand on top of it or overstand it? Will it always be emergent and no matter what, like like the IDW or like the Free Thinkers Club or the New Atheists or whatever, whatever group comes out and says we're against this tribalism. They become a tribe. They stop uh, criticizing e each other. Then they, they start to, you know, very softly perform purity tests on their followers and stuff like that. Well, I, I think it is possible to sort of give up your ideological tribalism and become like a, a nationalist. You know, if you're thrown into a situation where there's a war. Okay. Uh, then you might you might find yourself side you know joining forces with your old enemy to support your country, or if there's a religious conflict or something like that. So it's you might change your religion. Though. It's always there are well. I think the only time it isn't is when you're in a situation of um, great plenty and security and prosperity, which allows you to become a sort of a fragmented, atomized individual mm -hmm. and to pursue pursue your own private goals. And that has the problem of, of sort of um, destroying the, the unity of polity, which is something that I discuss in the question of whether or not um, postmodernism is a form of decadence, where you have the decadent who's pursuing uh, his own private uh, pleasure. Yeah. And uh, how mm. is this different from postmodernism? Because the, 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 uh, the depraved decadent of the 1890s, who's a pleasure seeker, who's a, uh, a, li a libertine, who's a, who's a drinker and an adulterer and a, and, a, and a spurner of public morals, how is this different from the, the postmodernist yeah. who says, um, you know, your, your rules, your traditions, you, so they're, they're hidebound, they are absolutely limiting, and these are things that I reject. So I've discussed, uh, I discussed in one essay, you know, the possibility that um, postmodernism is essentially just a, a modern form of decadence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It seems like uh, with postmodernism, you start to stack up inside joke with an inside joke with an inside joke which eventually just leads to slopsism. Like there's only me because only I can get what I'm talking about. And the only way I can actually afford to do that is because I'm living in a decadent enough culture that either supports this or celebrates it in one way or another. Yeah. The, you, you don't, you don't find decadence in subsistence economies because there's no room for the individual to be decadent. There's no one supporting him. He has to work. He has to work. If he doesn't work, he's going to starve. Mm -hmm. So it's only in a, in a situation of um, prosperity and stability that the decadent can exist and then you have a problem of when you start to prioritize the decadent or okay. um the the, the non-conformist then this starts to break down the unity of society hmm. so there is a there is a balance between um uh being cons having a conservative uh framework and then also having a, an individualist element that there is a necessarily uh, a problem you have to strike a balance because if you go too far one way you're going yeah. to end up with an ossified society which is repressive and authoritarian on the other side you're going to end up with with a chaotic situation with individuals pursuing their own liberty and a fractured society mm -hmm.
And so when I wanted to ask about public funding and if that was just kind of a, a blip that good art could be funded by the public and if if good art necessarily needs necessity and by necessity it needs demand it needs people demanding good art and that's why i've been playing this video game i've been trying to play this video game i keep on dying over and over again um by this um by this company called from software and they've done the dark souls trilogy and bloodborne and then they just came out with a samurai game um and it's very very difficult until you figure out how you're supposed to act and so it keeps me on the edge of my seat it's complete it's totally demanding of all my resources of attention and and yet at the same time it's completely beautiful the the, the i mean it's not cutting edge but it's just gorgeous and in, in the way that it's presented and the way that it draws me in and it seems like every now and then there are there's like a concrescence of you know genius or or all the things align to make this perfect thing uh this uh, artwork or this piece of art and i wonder if that can ever be produced by some sort of like government funding if government funding necessarily falls into a bureaucratic ideological wasteland of you know we're just gonna uh, our supporters bourgeoisie and you know whatever whatever ruling party is funding us, we have to, you know, support their ideas. Well, I think that this is, this is a huge question because um, you could say, well, no public subsidy at all. And you'd lose the opera, you'd lose ballet, you'd lose okay. uh, everything. Like legacy arts the, then. Yeah. Except, yeah. But you'd also lose everything except a few stately homes and your most important art collections because the, the, all the others are not going to be self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. You have to have a degree of public funding for it, but then should that apply to fine art that's contemporary? Um, the arts funding landscape in Britain was established after the Second World War when we had this devastating situation where uh, the, account, the economy was on its knees, there was no money for uh, any sort of ambitious art mm -hmm. at all. Um, and so there was this perceived um, public good in funding um, uh, organizations through an organization called the Arts Council, which would allocate grants to various uh, venues and publishers to develop sort of avant-garde advanced art. Um, hmm. And at the time, this made a lot of sense. And I think it worked for, you know, sort of 30, 40 years. But then you can see by the 1980s and 90s that it's starting to lose its way because um, at that stage, uh, there was the YBA, the Young Artists, uh, Young British Artist boom in the 1990s. And then you had a lot more money going into the arts from private companies, um, private collectors, uh, where it became fashionable to be an art collector in a way that it hadn't been for quite a while. Hmm. Um, and so then you could say, well, actually, the arts are self-sustaining. Uh, why are we busy funding exhibitions of um, Sarah Lucas and Damien Hirst? when they've got a big fancy West End gallery in London and they're getting shows in New York and Tokyo and Johannesburg and stuff, why are we funding that? Um, mm -hmm. But then on the other hand, there, are, there is a case for supporting art in a way that um, you could back, you know, you know there's that, this common American thing of, oh, oh the, the state doesn't back winners. You know, it's not very good at choosing good art. Yeah. Um, and that's true to a degree, but then I'll tell you something about the, uh, the computer industry in Britain. The, um, the British government in the 1970s had this habit of um, putting funding into private um, industry, and it was usually absolutely disastrous, and it ended up with terribly inefficient companies that would end up costing the state millions and millions and then go bankrupt, and, and it was a disaster. But one of the things that the British government did was it had a it took a stake in something called Spectrum, uh, Sinclair Computers. Um, and this allowed uh, Sinclair, Clive Sinclair, the developer of um, Sinclair Computers, to develop um, something called uh, the ZX80, the ZX81, and then the ZX Spectrum, which were home computers, very cheap and affordable. Hmm. And what happened was this kick-started uh, home programming. So one of the reasons why you see such a, or you did see such a strong uh, British lead in the gaming industry was because all these kids 
um, I'd learned to program as um, youngsters on these young, on these cheap uh, Z, uh, ZX eighty ones and ZX Spectrum computers, um, and they had developed this modding scene and, and built up these uh, new games, and this uh, carried over into the PC era. So you could say that it was because of British funding, state funding, that you had this boom in um, mm -hmm. computer game development. Um, you could also say that it's British funding of uh, universities, which led to the YBA boom, which um, uh, advanced British art commercially in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. it, you know. But to get back to that point about um, the state not backing winners, and I'm sure we could look back and probably forget about all the losers and pick out the one or two winners, right? But in a more, in a more philosophical vein, how can the collective choose and support ambitious, the, the ambitious, the, the ambitious entity or individual? Uh, is that possible? Is, is not the ambitious person the one who's going to actually erode the collective by pr proposing or instituting a new form of collectivism or a new way of binding one together, like, like a Beethoven or something like that? Well, I would, I would say, I mean, as speaking from my sort of English liberal roots, I would say the best way for people to support uh, art is individually by attending exhibitions, by buying pictures, by buying catalogues or so on. Um, you know, even, even buying, you know, drawings or prints. You know, originally you could buy drawings or prints for sort of, you know, relatively small sums. And you could actually have a, a piece of work by that artist. And you would buy it because you loved it. Um, if you happen to select an artist who became popular, this work of art that you had would increase in value. So you'd also get this monetary, potential monetary return as well. And I would say that that's a very good way of supporting the arts. Uh, collectively supporting the arts, it's, um, well, that's a big subject. I, I, don't, have, I don't have a pat answer yeah. for that. Well, what about, uh, what about if the UK government started to invest in comic books? Would that ever happen? Um, comic books are, are designed specifically to attract the individual investor, right? And, and by that, I mean just the kid that wants to read the comic book and then the adult that wants to read the comic book because they've been reading comic books since they were a kid. Yeah. Um, it depends. I mean, if you, if you could do it in a way that was hands-off, um, certainly, yes, you could, you could. And this was the way that the Arts Council always operated, that it would invest money in a, in a sort of hands-off way. So that you would give money to an arts venue that was generally quite uh, adventurous, but they were carefully run, they were financially prudent, and they were backing serious art, so that the state was putting money into serious art. But um, what you find now is that because the government, NGOs, and arts venues have all bought into the identity politics thing, yeah. they are saying oh, well, we will support your venue, but um, okay. we're going to have, we've got certain specifications in terms of the demographics of um, the staff, of the artists, and the visitors. So your visitors, mm. you must hit a certain, you know, certain targets for uh, community outreach or whatever. Mm. And so, which sounds quite nice, but then there's a whole political agenda that comes with this. Yeah. So what we've gone is we've gone for the hands-off approach to funding, which was sort of hit and miss, but it was at least dedicated in principle to producing serious art, to the hands-on way, yeah. where the government says you will be definitely targeting women and uh, ethnic minorities and poor people. You know, there's a sort of great stress on uh, poor people having access to art. Mm -hmm. um, they have access to art generally. I mean, in free art galleries, of course, they which is often the case, they've got access to art, but very many of them just are more interested in other things. And I say, well, that's down to the person's choice. So I don't think the government should be attempting to dictate the demographics of the audience. I mean, that's crazy. Yeah. In your book of essays, you very strongly and smartly and creatively critique uh, a certain ideology, uh, the progressive ideology, Marxism, you get, get into Hegel, um, do you, in in writing about this and thinking about this, have you started to like brainstorm of different ways of uh, rescuing the arts, all these different nodes of art that are being taken over by these cultural interests? 
Um, the only way is to decentralize and to defund, which is an extremely demoralizing and depressing way of thinking about things. That the only way you can think of saving them is by saying, is getting them away from these arts councils and these arts ministries and um, these charities. You know, you have individual charities which are saying, you know, we are giving money specifically to venues which are conducting social outreach campaigns, which mm -hmm. is, you know, essentially political art mm -hmm. um, and it's it's quite depressing that the only thing I can think of is to say detach yourself from central funding or from um, funding which comes through local or local government or NGOs and try and go back to a private system where hmm. the public support art by buying it um, yeah. and visiting shows and so forth you have to um, enforce the get woke go broke Steve. yeah because because you can go to these exhibitions in arts council venues which receive uh, you know hundreds of thousands of pounds in subsidy uh you can go to these exhibitions and it's it's a bunch of you know, not very good art let's say <laughs> and and you're and you're in an empty gallery and there's no one else there because everyone has been to one of these shows before and they know what's inside yeah and they know and they don't want to get a, they don't want to get a finger wagging lecture about how they're racist and evil and yeah. how they're you know they're disgusting people and they find the art incomprehensible and boring yeah and so incompetent they, and incomprehensible and in, yeah absolutely so they don't want to go in for that you know, uh -huh. and they don't want to pay like you know five pounds or ten pounds for a ticket to go and see this stuff. Why would you? Yeah. Um, and so you think, well, these these places these places would go broke overnight yeah. if they had to provide the art that was really exciting. And that doesn't necessarily mean conservative, or even necessarily popular um, or populist art. They could do something that's uh, mm. in between. Yeah, you know, you get you get really good um, crowds going for exhibitions of uh, Modigliani and the, the Impressionists and mm -hmm. Mondrian and and Rothko and, and they were all considered advanced, difficult art at the time. They were derided yeah. at the time. You know, Van Gogh only sold famously only one, only sold one painting during his lifetime, um, and yet he packs out the galleries today. Yeah, I think it's possible to strike a balance between following advanced art and um, providing what people want and introducing people to something that they will be excited by. But you never, you can never persuade people by introducing to what, them to art that calls them an idiot and a racist yeah. and, a, and, a, and a thug. You know. What are your thoughts on digital gallery, galleries and crowdsourcing with regards to like, what would you say to an up and coming artist about like avoiding this stuff and following their dreams and making a, carving out a, a space for themselves online or via online well th this is i mean it's um making art digitally is not my sort of thing but i can definitely see that there is um advantages to having direct communication with an audience through uh, a website so i've got a website which presents my paintings which is not particularly interactive but mm -hmm. certainly what you find with uh, comics gate is that you had um independent producers who could no longer work for these um, politically progressive companies and they had to self-publish and so what they did was they had um, YouTube um, channels so diversity in comics which is now called uh, comics matter um, he Richard C Meyer developed this system where he would be talking uh, to his audience all the time he'd be doing live stream he'd be doing uh, producing uh, commentary videos and uh, comic book reviews every day on his YouTube channel. He was building up, I think he's up to about sort of 100,000 now. Ethan Van Stuyver, a very successful uh, artist who worked for DC. Um, he's got a channel that's got now 120,000 or so. And they've both, they've uh, from their crowdsourcing campaigns, they've earned hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, and they're essentially broadcasting from their from their bedrooms, as mm -hmm. it were. Mm -hmm. um, and they've developed. I mean, obviously, uh, Ethan Van Skyver had a good reputation beforehand. Yeah. Um, but this is a way of interacting with your audience and uh, you know reaching out beyond the gatekeepers, the political gatekeepers. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I would certainly recommend uh, young artists, young creators, to think about doing something like that. You think that there's room for for digital curators like? There's the fine artists who I'm sure aren't going to be good on camera, but excellent on a canvas. 
but like, I, I wonder if like, got, oh, that's right. That's very diplomatic, Benjamin. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder if there isn't, uh, an opportunity for the curators who are good on the camera, um, to go around and, and to be the ones that form these museums of contemporary art that connect people who are interested in it with, uh, living artists that, that, um, that are right out there right now. Have you seen any instances of that? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, there are certain, there are some video uh, producers who, I think there's some podcasts as well, strangely, that um, mm -hmm. do work in the fine arts and they talk about um, mm. exhibitions and sometimes they can go in with their camera and uh, film some of the art. I think there's sometimes there's, there's copyright problems and we've got Article 13 coming down the track. But, oh, uh, have, do you know that, much about that? Uh, only that it's going to be a disaster if it goes ahead. That's all you it's know. Voted through, it's been voted through uh, by the EU Parliament, which is a body which can rubber stamp uh, legislation but cannot um, retract it. So they cannot, <laughs> they cannot, even if they wanted to, they cannot now change their mind and remove this from the book. What it's, is it? Could you, could you outline that? I just want uh, a European well, I think document. it's um, I think article I think it's article 11 of the uh, internet copyright bill um, basically uh, what it's going to do is it's going to screw over people creators who post stuff online so this is going to affect the people we've just been talking about um, mm -hmm. so uh, there's going to be like they're going to have to develop uh, service providers are going to have to develop algorithms which are automatically going to weed out works that violate copyright and so of course this, this is going to be such a huge system it's going to be an absolute disaster because it's not going to be able to distinguish between fair use parody um uh, even copies you're going to have you're going to find you're going to be copyright struck by yourself mm -hmm. automatically so if your work is already registered and then you want to do it on something else, you want to use this image again on another platform, you're going to get copyright struck by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's going to be an absolute disaster. Yeah, if um, you take a picture and, and a bus drives by with a Cartier ad on it, then you're not going to be able to show that picture and probably yeah, even yeah. get thrown in jail been, possibly or fined. Yeah, I mean, there's, been, there's been the case of um, original people um, performing songs on YouTube, uh, original songs, and getting copyright struck for that hmm. um, because it's just been it's just been hoovered up by the algorithm and and they're stuffed and but who then can what, repeal this um i don't know if they can uh, hmm. the best thing to do is to leave the european union you're that, not that's allowed a, to that's a, you're not that's allowed a, to well, brexit our well our british politicians are telling us that we're not allowed to do it even though we voted for it so, yeah. That's another big subject. That's okay. But what you were saying about um, curating and so forth, I mean, it happens in the form of uh, critics. Yes. Um, the, in, the, uh, in my role as, a, as an art critic, I've got a blog, um, alexanderadamsart.wordpress.com. And so there I act as a traditional critic. And I, uh, I, I don't talk about contemporary art. I talk about sort of modern art and uh, romantic art and classical art and so forth, because I'm not uh, so interested in contemporary art. But certainly, uh, if a curator could, and they do, have these blogs or websites where they talk about different artists and they can promote them or they can critique them. Um, so certainly on the digital space, in terms of uh, blogs or websites or uh, YouTube or podcasts, there's certainly a lot of space for um, independent uh, influencers to make their thoughts known and to uh, push work that they like mm -hmm. if fine art is necessarily elite necessarily not for everybody uh until it becomes popular let's say like van gogh uh for instance right he wasn't for anybody of his time he's only for people now by the millions of people go and go and see him um if that's the case then what is what is the goal of fine art um not the goal, but what, how does it protect itself from being, you know, like, like checkmated by these ideological factions that, that kind of basically shore up what it is and then basically subtract the actual essence of it from what they call fine art? Um, well, I think it's essentially that you have to, 
I think what we've got a problem is we've got an oversupply of artists. Yeah. Because um, another essay that in, in the book I, t I talk about, I think we talked about in, in our last interview when we talked about um, subsidies creating from the state creating an oversupply of artists. Yeah. What we've got now is we've got an oversupply of artists. So often we've got a, a huge swathe of me mediocre artists, artists who really shouldn't be artists. They should be doing something else. And, and, you know, and, and, and maybe painting or making art in their, in their spare time and exhibiting sort of part time. But they're not uh, they're not professional artists. The problem is that um, because of this oversupply, it's very easy for you to go to your identity and to push your identity politics as a way of uh, promoting your art. So mm. every day I get as an art critic, I get sort of 20, 30, 40 emails, press releases. Um, and, you know, in the first paragraph, you get you you can tell their gender, their sexual orientation, their political outlook. Um, you know, whatever, it, because it is written there in the, in, the, in the press release. And so often this is the go-to position that you either go to your identity or you go to a political position in order to promote your art. Hmm. So the, the way to combat that is to make political um, positioning less uh, remunerative to the artist. Um, so mm -hmm. that would be, again, becoming more independent, uh, trying to sever your, your ties with, um, with the government, with, uh, small, with um, um, publicly funded arts, because that will detach um, the artist from the incentive to produce political art. Fuck politics, man. Yeah. Well, I but actually no, because you 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 write some pretty amazing political commentary. So. <laughs> oh, I, I wish I could just write about Rembrandt and Vermeer and Picasso. I don't take this away from me, please. No, you should you should uh, try to get in the e Economist, the e Economist. You should try to get yeah. some of the stuff in the Economist, if it's not well, already have... there. Uh, I have I have stuff um, oh. that's coming out in uh, no no in uh, Standpoint magazine, oh. which is a, a political uh, monthly in Britain. Um, there's another one that's going to be appearing on a fairly well known internet uh, website, which I can't name at the moment because it hasn't been confirmed, it hasn't come out. But you can also find my work on Spiked, uh, which is very much uh, Spiked website is very much concerned with uh, free expression and fighting identity politics. That's my identity, man. I'm the yeah. anti-identitarian. Well, they, they gave me a review. They described me as bold, which I think is a code word for reckless. <laughs> uh, reckless in what sense? Like, like you, well, re well, reckless in the, in the personal sense that here I am, I'm writing negative things about the Arts Council, yeah. and I'm an artist, and, and guess who I'm going to have to be applying to to try and exhibit yeah. my art? Exactly. That's what, I, that's what I wanted to bring up at the very, very beginning. You said that you now have the reputation... To write these things and the first thing i thought I'm like well you have the reputation to burn i guess that's what that means right? well i some people would say well, i've burnt it already with this book that you know i've hmm. i've been sort of quite bellicose um about the problems with yeah. uh, progressivism in fine art education and the exhibition and the funding organizations in the government direction of um fine art funding policy yeah. So I've, I've 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 burnt some bridges and made some enemies, um, yeah. but you know I feel like well, it's a matter of principle, and there's no point in me having a position like this where I have any any sort of voice or any sort of influence if I'm not opposing these things that I think are absolutely destroying the art world, and yeah. I think they are. I I've been watching certain um, publications and and big <laughs> entities. Uh, being taken over by these identitarians that then use the capital, the cultural capital, let's say New York Times, Nature Magazine, National Geographic. They're, they're taking all that capital and they're spending it on horrible, horribly thought out ideas. Um, and then, and then plus like horribly outcomed philosophies yeah. that's already proven. Um, so what they're doing is they're, they're just spending the, uh, the reputation that has been, saved up by these um by these these entities on, on yeah. bad ideas the same thing 
has to happen to small thinkers, independent thinkers such as yourself. Get enough reputation and then spend it on, or, or at least wager your reputation on on what you think is true. And and hopeful, hopefully that those ideas will pan out and then there'll be some sort yeah, of cultural uh, reckoning or re- remuneration at least. Well, I mean, you hope so, but you know, I mean, I don't know how many, I know that some of my editors, I would work for a number of publications. I'm pretty sure that one or two of those editors are not going to be returning my pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, but you just hope, well, okay, well, a few more people, if enough people buy this book, then I've got another book in preparation, yeah. which is going to be, you know, along similar lines, different subjects. Well, you'll always have 38th tier media such as myself to speak to. Oh, I'm sh- I'm sure after all those uh, all those the extra subscriptions you got from Alf's Void, I think you're up to sort of <laughs> maybe 35 level. Yeah, media. maybe, I don't know. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Uh, Alexander Adams, I have to go. This um, this is found on Amazon, right? That your books on Amazon. Yes, you can also order it through your local bookshop. Bookshop, if yeah. you still have one, you can also order it through the um, the publisher's website, which is Imprint Academic. And all that will be found in the description, as well as links to your various publications. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I always I have such a hard time like shutting these things down. No way to. Yeah, no, no, no that's that's perfect. Thank okay, you. Okay, there we go.